Willkommen, bienvenue, and welcome back to Let's Learn the Electric Pace with Light. Sorry about the lighting. I can never seem to get it right. But we've learned intervals, we've learned shifting, we've learned overtones and whatnot. You're probably like, Light, it's time, it's time, it's time we learn some scales. And you, dear viewer, would be wrong. Now's not the time for scales. I know this is where scales would normally come when learning an instrument. Some of you are itching for scales, which I don't know why, because everyone hates practicing them. Today, you're going to learn accompaniment, how to be a bass player. Because being a bass player, it's about being behind the scenes, making sure everything's working smoothly. Scales are for being out front and doing things flashy-like. Bass player doesn't need that sort of glory yet. So what you're going to learn today is the background accompaniment pattern. It's not a good word for it because you're not going to play this behind I've Got Rhythm or the dozens, if not hundreds of tunes that use the same chord progression. But it'll give you the building blocks for it. It's the foundation of how the harmony works for I've Got Rhythm and for a lot of pieces. And it centers around this right here, our good friend, the circle of fifths. And in particular, this B flat right here you can point at it really well. So yeah, I've got rhythm. Who would have thunk it would be such an influential piece? Well, it's not necessarily I got rhythm that set this train in motion, but it's the one that gets the credit. So speaking of B flat, that is the key of this piece. Now, when I say key, I just mean the note that is essentially the most important. It's where you start, it's where you end, and it influences most of the things that happen in between. Now, a piece could change key in the middle. So anytime you've been listening to a pop tune and suddenly it's uh, just feels a little higher. Yeah, that's a modulation. That's where it changes the key. I got rhythm, you could debate whether or not the key changes or not in the middle bit. But that debate is not important to us today. So, step one. Where's B flat? So, you have to go and find this B flat because we've got E, A, D, and G, which are all the way over here on the other side of the circle. Oof. How do we get all the way over here? Well, yeah, that that's a problem. Whenever you play with wind players, saxophonists like me, trumpet players, they love B flat. B flat is a good time. E flat, also pretty good time. F, still pretty good. But the further away you get, the worse of a time we have. And notice how E, bass player's favorite note, is all the way on the other side of the circle. It's as far from what the wind players want as possible. Oh. So if you're gonna play with wind players, gotta get used to playing in B flat or somewhere nearby. If you're playing with a guitar, they like E just as much as you do. So you don't have to worry. Piano, they don't care about the key. Piano will be fine. They like C, but C at least is closer. Playing in E is okay for a pianist. It's probably fine. Drummer, drummer, lo drummer loves all the keys. So how do we find that B flat? Well, you could use the circle or you could use the semitones or you can be like, it's a tritone away because directly across the circle is a tritone. Remember the tritone? It's a one, a two, a three tones or a one, two, three, four, five, six semitones or just this sound. And that's your B flat. So get used to the, that B flat because you're going to be coming back to it a lot. And if you lose track of this B flat, the whole thing is sunk. It starts drifting down. Eventually the tune will be in A and it'll be all your fault. So find this B flat, slide into it. 
finger into it, do whatever you need to, to be absolutely certain of where that B flat is. Get it in your ear, get it in your brain, make sure it never escapes. That's how important B flat is to this tune. So, are you okay with the B flat? From there, we use this circle. And we're gonna go in a clockwise direction. So we have B flat, F, C, and G. This is gonna be the majority of our first pattern. So how do you find that? Well, you have your B flat. Going clockwise around this circle are perfect fifths going up. So there's your F right there. So from the episode on intervals, you just go up a string and up two frets for that perfect fifth. And then you go from F to C. Well, you just go here and up. And you got your C. And you do it again, C to G. And so you've got yourself a B flat, an F, a C, and a G. That's what you're gonna need for the vast majority of this piece. You're done. Well, you're not really done because you listen to that and you're like, that is really high. This is starting to infringe on the territory of the other players. And as a bass player, you should never infringe on other people's property. So what do you do? Well, you can always bring it down because Going this way around the circle is not just going up perfect fifths, but it's also going down perfect fourths. And so we can start off with our B flat here because we want our B flat to be here. I mean, we could go down a perfect fourth from here. One, two, three, four, five, all the way down here. But that requires a fairly large shift that you might not be able to do right now. I know I'm not gonna do that reliably. So instead, we'll start off by going up the fifth, but then you go down a perfect fourth, which is just the same fret on the string below it. So this note here versus this note up here, they're an octave apart. So B flat, F, C, and then you just go up a fifth to G. So they're all right here, right here. So there's your B flat, your F, your C, and your G. Now your B flat is still the most important. The next most important is the F because it goes, it leads into it using dominant motion. Dominant motion pushes towards where it's going. There are two easy types, going down a perfect fifth, then going up a perfect fourth. The slightly more complicated version is going up a half step. Which we'll use later. That's also a dominant motion. Now what's dominant mean? Just, just that. that. That's what dominant means in these situations. It's that motion that makes a Western European musician feel fulfilled at the end. And there's a lot of dom dominant motion going on because you also have So going up that perfect fourth here, dominant motion. Going down this perfect fifth here, dominant motion. So it makes you think Maybe we're supposed to be doing these things the other way around, and we are. Instead of starting at G and working down to B flat to introduce it to you, I just wanted to build it from the B flat. But in practice, we're gonna be using the dominant motion to go down to the B flat. So we start on the G and then go down to the C, F, B flat. So we've got dominant motion all the way down. So dominant 
motion. And since we start on B flat, because that's the key, we then jump to the G. So we shift up and hit it here. But for the sake of ornamentation in the future, let's shift the whole thing. Because doing this is nice and easy if you've been practicing your fifths and your shifts, but it's too easy because you're not going to go just as a bass player because there's a lot of time that you've got between here and here and then here and then here. So what you need to practice is doing this. With just your first finger. And then with just your middle finger. Probably not just with your third finger, but it's worth practicing anyway. And then with your pinky, in case you approach it from below. But it's important to get all of your fingers being able to do this pattern. Because tons and tons of pieces use this dominant motion all the time. And so if you can do it anywhere on the fretboard, with any finger, at any tempo, you'll have a lot of pieces that you can do things for. So, we're in B flat. We start on C, go to F, wait, start on G, go to C, go to F, and to B flat. Now, we don't actually start on G for the tune. We start on B flat. So it's B flat, G, C, F is the actual pattern. That's how it's grouped. It's B flat, uh, yeah, B flat, G, C, F, and then B flat, G, C, F. And it makes you want to go to B flat. But it actually ends on that F. So that's one pattern. There are two patterns in this piece. That's it. Two. You have learned the vast majority of this piece already. So where do we go from here? Well, now, well, we, we just grab a different section of the circle. So the dominant motion from G all the way down to B flat is good. Helps to focus on B flat, but sometimes you want to take a little departure. And so you get to something that isn't the dominant of B, you actually want to go to the subdominant of B flat. Notice how the dominant of B flat has dominant motion towards it. The subdominant does not. The movement from E flat to B flat is not nearly as strong. So here's our good friend B flat. So that was F to B flat. E flat to B flat, on the other hand. That doesn't sound as final. So E flat to B flat doesn't sound as final as say B flat to E flat. And that's what subdominant motion is. It's not quite as satisfying, but it gives you a nice little departure. So, most of the time, we're going from uh, G to B flat, and now we're taking a little interlude to E flat land. But let's treat E flat with some respect and give it a couple of dominant motions as well, but not as many. So we're going to give it two dominant motions instead of three. So 
hey, look, we already know where F is. F is right here. Because that's the dominant of B flat. So we give it an F, then we give it a B flat, and we give it an E flat. But we don't want E flat to feel like the new home, so let's go to A flat before going back to B flat because B flat's home. So this new pattern is F, B flat, E flat, A flat. Takes you away a little bit, but not too far. So that pattern again, F, B flat, E flat, A flat. It's the same pattern, just shift it down a little bit. Instead of going, uh, let's see. You're just going, shifted it down one step or two semitones, depending on how you want to look at it. That's it. We're done. That's the entire piece. Those two patterns. But now you need to figure out how to arrange them, how to play them, and how time goes by. So we do pattern number one. Then we do pattern number one again. Then we do pattern number two. And then we do pattern number one again. And then we do pattern uh, number one. And pattern number two, or pattern number one, pattern number one. Pattern number two, pattern number one. So, oh, my camera just moved. That's no good. So, pattern number one, pattern number one, pattern number two, pattern number one. We would call that an A, A, B, A form. Because we do the same thing twice, do something different, and then come back to the first thing again. A, A, B, A. Okay, following? Well, that's not just the form of just this little bit, it's the form of the entire piece, because then you take that A, A, B, A, and do it again. Then you take it to the bridge, which is something completely different, except that it's not. It's pattern number one, just four times as slow. And then you go back and do it again, A, A, B, A. I know, I said a lot of letters there, and you don't really follow. That's fine. We're going to walk ourselves through it. So pattern number one starts with a B flat. And then you go to the C, uh, G, sorry. So B flat, G, C, F. That's pattern one. B flat, G, C, F. And now we move to pattern number two, which is F, B flat, E flat, A flat. And then we go back to pattern number one, B flat, G, C, F, and then back to the top. And then pattern number two. Back to pattern number one. And now pattern number one, super slow. So, do we start? No, we don't start on B flat for this one. We actually start on G. So we do G, C, F, B flat. Fairly certain. Might need to double check on that one. Uh, 3625, so probably not. I'm slightly deceiving you. The bridge is slightly different. We actually go all the way up to D. We do D, G, C, F. So it's up here. And then back to the top. Two. One. So 
that bridge, again, instead of being B flat, F, C, and G, so these four, it takes it up just a little bit to focus on the dominant. And it's pretty strong, so we give it three dominants of its own. D to G to C to F. It focuses on the F, which leads you back to the B flat. So that was all of the things all in a row, but what do you do with the time? Now, I could talk about whole notes and chord notes and how to read rhythms and all that, but it's nowhere near as important as being able to play rhythms. And to do that, you listen to rhythms. You listen to music, listen to what they're doing with time. And if you listen long enough, you hear an underlying current of equally spaced taps. Now, they might not hit every single one of them, but time goes by consistently, just one after the other. Might be at this speed, it might be a little bit faster, could be a lot slower. But each piece of music has that underlying tempo. Ever hear the word tempo? That's what it is, the underlying speed at which it's going. So when I was going, There are two things you might have felt, either one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, or what I was feeling is a one, two, three, four, 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 a one, which is the tempo of the two. But you can make it faster or slower. Take it as slow as you need it to. But if you have a tempo of a one, two, three, four, a one, two, three, four, a one, that means the bridge is going a one, two, three, four, a one, two, three, four. But that's still faster than the bridge is supposed to go. It's a one, two, three, four, two, two, three, four, a one, two, three, four, two, two, three, four, a one, two, three, four, two, two, three, four, a one, two, three, four, two, two, three, four, to the top. Two, one, two, three, four, a one, two, three, four, a one, two, three, four, a one. Now, why does that matter? Well, Knowing how fast the tune actually is, it tells you how much time you've got to fill things in. Because you're not going to go a one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, a one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. That's so boring. So instead, you can do things like a one, a one, two, three, four, oh, oh, body. So you fill it in with notes that are useful. Now, I haven't taught you about what goes with these notes, but it's often safe to go to the fifth above. And to lead into it from a half step below. So let's take the tempo down a tiny bit and try that throughout, through each of the pattern ones, each of the pattern tune twos, and through the B section. So. Hmm. Is that really the tempo we want to take it? Ah, let's give it a try. Oh, that's wrong. So there's pattern one. if we take it really slow. Well, let's double check whether or not that's even the right number of bars. 
oh, but it's not. Because for the teaching, I was having it go really fast. So each of those was taking up half a measure. A measure is just a grouping of a certain number of notes in a certain meter. And those are things I don't really need to cover with you today, but covers four beats, which is a whole measure. So we would have one, two, three, four of those per pattern. So four bars per pattern which means you have four, eight, 12, 16 bars. Ooh, that would make it a really long thing. So clearly this pattern isn't gonna work because you only have one, two, three, four, a one, two, three, four, a one. So it's actually, mm -hmm, is a bar, measure. And then another measure, two measures per pattern. Two, four, six, eight. 16 gets you to 32 bars total. That's where we ought to be. So the bridge. Two, two, three, four. Three, two, three, four. Four, two, three, four. Five, two, three, four. Six, two, three, four. Seven, two, three, four. Eight, two, three, four. Is the same length. Just have to think these things through sometimes. So, so you could do something like that to fill it in if you're not happy with. Because anything else, it's probably gonna be too much, gonna take too much time. You could also do things rhythmically. I want to So you can do things like that to make it a bit more interesting but the place where it really needs it is that bridge. What do you do? Something like that. I messed up a little there towards the end but you need just fill those eight beats. So those are the sorts of things that get you through the entire piece. So let's go through it one more time without all of the embellishments such that you see where the notes are and you get a nice clean read on it. So a one, a two, a one, two, three, four, one, two. Let's try that again, a little bit slower. A one, a two, a one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four, a one, two, three, four, a one, two, three, four, a one, two, three, four, da, do, 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 back to the top. Do it again. To pattern two. 
pattern one. End of the bridge. Now I threw some embellishments in, I sped up a little bit, which leads me to my final point for this episode. You will eventually need to be the timekeeper. I know the drums are in charge of the tempo, but the bass is in charge of the tempo. So you need to catch whether or not you speed up towards the end, or if you tend to slow down, if you speed up during difficult parts or slow down during difficult parts, you just need to know yourself. I push through things. Except when they're supremely difficult and then I just come to a grinding halt when it's something very new to me. But when it's something I've done a billion times, I tend to go faster than I should. And that time was a pretty good example of it, I think. But that's rhythm changes. That's how you can do some super basic accompaniment to somebody who's playing a tune based on this. Now, not many rock tunes are based on this. So if you have any rock, R&B, hip hop, whatever sorts of tunes that you are interested in and want to play with your friends or with yourself or along with the radio, please let me know down in the comments because I can show you how to play along with just about anything, because they all use these sorts of foundations. And to start off, all you really need is just that root with it. You don't need the... Or even still the walking bass that we'll eventually get to. Just starting off, And you'll be amazed at how far just learning these fifths and this circle will get you, even in pop, rock, and country. This was a long episode, had a lot to cover. Future ones will hopefully be shorter, such that you can just digest them all at once. But I figured for this first one, there's a lot to learn. And if you try to break it up, you're going to forget all of it. Hopefully you made it this far in the episode. If you didn't, eh, you're not listening anyway. Either way, I will see you in the next episode of Let's Learn the Electric Bass with Light. <laughs>